All right, welcome to another FinTech Surge Advanced Team Conversation hosted by John Lillywhite. Today we're joined by Gabrielle Incirillo. Hi, Gabrielle. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so your job title is Head of Market Development, Financial Technology and Innovation at the Financial Services Regulatory Authority. It's a big job title. What does it involve? Uh, it's just a long job title. It's a long job title. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate you You're taking welcome. the time, you know, to have a chat and all. But yes, so um, I'm currently the head of market development um, within the fintech team of ADGM. So ADGM, Abu Dhabi Global Market, is an international financial center that is made up of three independent authorities, completely separate. So we have a registration authority, the financial services regulatory authority, which is where I sit, which licenses all sorts of financial institutions, fintech firms, everything to do with finances and an independent court called the ADGM courts. And essentially we are a zone where we have our own legislation, our own jurisdiction and our own laws based on English common law in order to have the best international practices for business. We're based out of Abu Dhabi on El Maria Island. Great, okay, so thanks for that short introduction to ADGM. We'll go into uh, that a little bit later, I guess. Um, first question more about you so what's your background how did you get into kind of financial services and fintech and what was your experience before you came to Abu Dhabi in the UAE and what are the kind of things you're interested in working on now uh, thanks for that well um when it comes down to it I guess I don't think anybody sets out to become a financial regulator right it's not really on kids wish lists in between I want to be a fireman I want to be, you know, a police officer. I want to be a marine biologist, maybe, if they're, you know, particularly book smart. Financial regulator does not fit in there at all. Um, so, <laughs> but they're missing out. Honestly, they're missing out. I, need to, I think we need to teach parents, you know, to have their kids dream broader. Um, so actually, I, I, back in the day, I was a run-of-the-mill um, financial analyst, right? I started off in finance like everybody else in the city of London, you know, wide-eyed. Is it wide-eyed or bright-eyed? I think it's bright-eyed. Bright-eyed, bushy hair, the whole, you know, look, excited. And I started off working at Bloomberg um, where I was actually building out financial models. And it's very, very funny, you know, the story because that was really my first foray into financial technology. Um, as you may or, or may not know, we like to say that Bloomberg was one of the oldest fintechs in, in, in the world, right? because they were essentially building out software and building out technology for banks, right? All banks have terminals. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, it's what they like yeah, to say. Because, I mean, I'm from publishing. So for me, Bloomberg is always, you know, B Bloomberg, the news website. But, but uh, I, I, I'm vaguely aware they have a role in financial markets because of the, the TV channel. But I didn't know about the terminals. That's interesting. Actually, they have a very, very big role so much so that, that when the terminals, when the terminals go out, there have been moments when the data centers have um, gone down very, very momentarily. And it's essentially caused outages for all of the city. It's caused outages for all of Wall Street. Nobody can function. Wow. You can't buy, sell bonds because nobody has information coming in. So basically they're an wow. information provider, whether it's, you know, right. Right. <laughs> whether it's financial information being come in, whether it's news being, you know, sent out, et cetera, they're this nexus. And I was working on this project called Enhanced Fundamentals at the time, which was about, you know, reworking the financials of big stock listed companies. And we went to present to a bank that I won't, I won't name, but it was a big bank in Canary Wharf. And, you know, one of their, really higher up. So he's looking at this project and he tells, and the first thing he mentions, he says, wow, this is great. I'm gonna to get to be able to really cut down on my first year analysts. I love what you guys are doing in FinTech now. I'd never heard that. This was in late 2014, early 2015 for me. Nobody was talking about mm. FinTech that much. They had started, but it was still, you know, a little bit niche. Mm. And that got me really, really thinking. I'm like, okay, what is this? What's happening? And uh, so I ended up leaving Bloomberg to go to Citibank to work with a city fintech team um, out of Miami, where I started working on implementing fintech solutions into the bank in order to better our processes. And that got me a little bit more delving into the whole topic about, okay, are fintechs out there to be competitors? Are they there to help out? 
what are fintechs role going to do? And keep in right. mind that this was in, I think, so this was about 2015, 2016 at that point. And uh, right. Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan Chase had just gone on the record saying that, oh, fintechs were here to stay and they were out for our bottom line. So a lot of banks were starting to get a little bit edgy, a little bit worried. Mm. And that's when the industry blew up. Um, suddenly VCs right. were, you know, saying, okay, the next big thing is fintech. We have to invest in fintech. And so I was able to purpose or well, repurpose my, my banking fintech experience and jumped over to uh, the venture capital industry where I spent the next, I guess, four years investing in fintech and insurance startups for mm -hmm. a VC called Plug and Play. So a seed stage investor yeah. based out of California. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been a plug and play. They're in the Middle East quite a lot, actually. Yeah, exactly. Well, when yeah. I joined, um, we didn't have any fintech offices outside of California. And I was lucky in the fact that I was able to help lead that expansion. Um, so mm. starting off with an office in Paris, which was our first hub, our first fintech hub, then an office in Frankfurt, an office in Amsterdam, one in Barcelona. And of course, my favorite office was always the office we had here that we launched in Abu Dhabi. So I was the director of FinTech for EMEA for Plug and Play. And uh, I was able to then leverage that relationship and leverage that, let's say, enjoyment of the ecosystem here to jump ship and join the regulator here. Super interesting. So thanks for that background. Um, there's a lot to discuss there. Um, but I think first we should possibly start with the kind of just a retrospective on how much things have changed. So I guess you kind of entered the market, it sounds like, or, or began learning about fintech in, in, you know, around 2014, you mentioned. And um, my experience, you know, turning up in, in London as a young graduate was pretty much the crash, 2008. You know, everything blows apart. Not only was it the crash though, but it was, you know, being being kind of one of those history grads that hangs out with other history grads and is at law school and doesn't really like a lot of the guys in the financial industries over in Canary Wharf or Canada Water because frankly, you know, uh, they don't like themselves. Know, I know that. So so there's that there was that or each other, so culture, don't worry. Culture. So, so but I guess what's happening is is a cultural shift. So at that time in London, you know, you you kind of if you were working in the financial industries, it was great. Everyone understood why you were doing it, but there was kind of a hint of an apology there, you know, you know, or, 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 or kind of a brash, this is why I'm doing it. But I think, and it wasn't really understood either, you know, it was, it was kind of, what do you guys do all day? But what's kind of happened is, okay, we've gone through the financial crisis and, and you know, the, because of that, and because I think a lot of other things is there's been this under, um, grand discussion around, you know, the economy and, and how the economy works and how finance works that's really, in a way, is generational. But then what's also happened is you've had technology kind of seeping into so many markets, but increasingly the, the financial markets too. And what I've been reading recently about how there's a lot of, you know, people relatively senior in, in the tech industry in, in Silicon Valley and in London who aren't looking to move now to the big tech companies but are looking to move into kind of this hybrid relationship between emerging technology and banking and financial institutions, because they understand this is where a lot of the, you know, macroeconomic shifts are happening. So suddenly, whereas, you know, what, what, all those years ago, kind of 2008, around that time, working in financial industries was, you know, seen as very old fashioned, not really the future kind of, you know, something to do then. Now you've almost got this shift where people who were previously a bit, you know, unsure about that environment, didn't see it as that dynamic, didn't see it as kind of, um, you know, emerging as the tech industry and now reevaluating financial services and thinking, hey, you know, there's, there's change happening here. And I know from a previous discussion on DFSA and what's happening in DIFC that when you go there now, you've got like the FinTech Hive guys who are all, you know, walking around in sneakers and talking, using the language of the startup industry to discuss financial innovation, but they're also sitting down with regulators and trying to understand what the banks want. So there's also a weird kind of merger bet between those two cultures. And of course that wasn't there about five years ago. So your story kind of captures that 
that arc in a way, that that trend that, 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 that kind of reflects this wider shift in financial technology. What do you think about that? Do you think that sounds accurate? So I think what we're seeing is that fundamentally, so back in the day, you know, you used to, when you had people who were very ambitious, right? You had all sorts of different types of talents. At some point you would end up with people going into, let's say law or, you know, they'd go into banking, they'd go into these sort of, you know, spick and span type professions that are quite clear cut, right? And then we had the emergence of, you know, companies like Google, you know, companies like PayPal, these big, big companies, right? That started really putting out. And suddenly we started seeing this talent being pushed out, let's say towards these, the big tech companies, right? And they attracted people, you know, with this promise of free lunches and you can wear sneakers to the office <laughs> and, you know, you can be yourself and sell it and be, you know, you don't have to compress yourself into a suit every day and fit a role and be just a number like that. And, and that was a lot of, a lot of the, I guess a lot of the attraction at the time because it was so different, right? And evidently the fintech, well, not the fintech industry, but the financial industry was like, first like, okay, what's happening? And slowly they started seeing that they were starting to get maybe less and less talent coming through, right? It really was mm. seeping off to other, other places. But then there also came the realization that financial institutions as they are, are not going to remain just, I don't want to say paper-based institution, be static, yes, static, but also I want to say mm. not just paper-based institution, because that's what we have this idea of, right? Banks are I highly sophisticated, yeah. nonetheless, right. they're highly right. sophisticated with a huge amount of technology um, that runs, mm. because evidently, if, if you start, can't access your money, wh what's happening? The world is going to stop, mm. right? Mm. And what fintech was able to do was able to bring back and push up a lot of this very interesting part of the financial industry, which I think got drowned out by this vision we had of, you know, aggressive investment bankers or, you know, dudes, you know, having too many pints in Canary Wharf and just being, you know, yeah. loud and raucous and just, you know, <laughs> putting on. And it really became much more of a, okay, I'm here to do this because I want to, you know, make maybe finances better, make place better. And that's a shift we're currently starting to find that's happening. Right. So, so what about your experience? I mean, one, how did you kind of move from venture capital into regulation, but also secondly, how does the experience working in Paris, Luxembourg, Barcelona, European kind of um, discussion. How does that compare to the discussion that you are exposed to in Abu Dhabi, but also increasingly because we're slightly closer to the East, we, ha we, we hear the discussions coming out of China and Singapore and some other countries. What, because you've got this interesting global perspective. So question one, VC to regulation, and then question two, how does that filter into your, your kind of experience in multiple markets? So the VC to regulation one is a good one because it actually seems like a completely out, out there jump. Who does that, right? But it actually makes perfect sense. When you're investing in new technology, oftentimes you find yourself trying to implement this technology or at least helping the founders that you invested in trying to implement them within banks. And you realize that you're operating in a gray zone. It's not even that you know it's black and white and they're on the black side and they're doing something bad. There simply aren't rules in place to allow them to use this technology or, or that would even punish them if they did, there's, it's a gray zone. And evidently so when sense. you work with financial institutions, they're very, very careful with regulation mm. and compliance and such, and they don't want to take off, off their regulators, right? It's right. especially right. after the crash and especially after all the, right. the names that were slinged at them. So, what happens is that if you really want your fintechs to grow and if you want to be a value add investor and actually provide value to apart from just, you know, cold, hard cash, which they can get from anyone. Right. It's, it's not mm. that difficult if you have a great solution. One of the means of doing that is basically going with them and helping them out. And I started becoming increasingly interested in how to speak to regulators. So whether it was how to speak with, you know, them in the UK, in Paris, so in France, um, whether it's in Luxembourg or, or Brussels, for instance, and going to speak with them on, okay, we have this new solution. Currently, we think it can be used, but we know there are current issues with, let's say, data privacy laws that might not 
you know, work at the moment? Can we have more clarity on the laws you wrote? That sort of thing. So it was really this idea of learning to speak to regulators and keeping this dialogue open. And when we opened up, uh, well, when Plug and Play opened up the office, so me, us at the time, we did it in partnership with ADGM, so here in Abu Dhabi. Mm. And it was really a wonderful experience because ADGM was a young regulator. They only opened up in 2015. So wow. young, okay. agile, building up their regulation from scratch. And oh, they very much do listen to companies. They listen to companies, they listen to financial institutions, they listen to startups, even if they're not licensed as part of them, because they want to know if the market reality fits the regulation that they're writing. And that's mm. fascinating. It's fascinating because it's a very, very um, comprehensive approach. It's about mm. maintaining this dialogue. It's not about having this issue of power play that you often get in older jurisdictions, such as in Europe, right. where the regulator sits above and won't give feedback down. This happens in many European countries, for instance. It's, it's like a black box that you don't know what's happening in there. Yeah, that's super interesting. Exactly. ADGEM was very open to use the market reality to build regulation that makes sense. And so evidently, you know, after working with so many regulators and investing in these startups, I start feeling that, okay, if we're really going to push the fintech industry as a whole and allow really good products and really good solutions to hit consumers, you know, to hit the market and be used by consumers, I, it wasn't just enough to, you know, be going there and putting ticket sizes in startups and hoping and maybe trying to knock on doors to help them out. Maybe I could use, you know, my skill sets to help a market as a whole. And uh, ADGEM were very, very, you know, kind of welcoming me in to do that. Yeah, I mean that it does make total sense within the financial services, you know, because it doesn't matter how great your startup is in that industry. If you don't have the, the regulation or the kind of ecosystem to be able for your app to be legal and work, you're never going to get anywhere. So totally understand how the VC and, and also the, the entrepreneur and needs to kind of also be in sync with the regulation and what works and what doesn't, and as you said, what reflects market behavior. But that's probably a good segue into trying to understand um, what the Abu, Abu Dhabi global market is kind of um, and what it's trying to achieve. There's lots of innovation taking place in financial markets all over the world. And it seems like for Abu Dhabi, um, ADGM is positioned to try and understand that and take advantage of it. So kind of what are the most exciting or important things it's working on? And, and how does it see its role within the wider UAE? So what is very, very nice about ADGM is evidently, you know, we're, we're structured on English common law, which means that any of the regulations that are written mm -hmm. or basically the frameworks that are published and sent out, they can, if, if other regulators want to take a look and have a look, they can evidently have a look. And uh, if they're inspired by our best practices, they can evidently, you know, follow suite and actually take that which is nice so, because it means that so interesting yeah if you actually you know, do sense. it right if you do it right the first time it can actually um follow follow through and influence let's say regulators across the world in order to create a much right. more cohesive um, regulatory environment across jurisdiction which would be ideal because mm. no fintech startup wants to join an ecosystem while they will be blocked only there and they can't expand or they can't scale or they can't go away. And the interesting mm. thing about Abu Dhabi um, as an ecosystem, because I think we mentioned you know, earlier that there was eventually, I've been in a few different ecosystems. So I've seen how different jurisdictions try to sell their startup ecosystem um, to FinTechs. And um, especially when it comes down to it, you know, we always ask, okay, everybody, how, what makes a really, really good startup friendly environment, right? Everybody wants to be the next Silicon Valley. They want to be the hub. But fundamentally, what is that? Is it, you know, talent? Is it access to funding? Is it um, cheap cost of living to allow people to, you know, have lower salaries and maintain all their equity? Um, is it having, you know, a, a great market where you have access to stakeholders? Is it a stable regulator that's going to listen? Or maybe if it doesn't listen, at least it's very, very stable and you know what rules to follow. Right on. What are really the ingredients of making a really good startup ecosystem? And different countries have done different things. You know, 
Paris, for instance, has really, really invested on the strength of their, their talent. They have great engineering schools. So they've been pushing startups like nobody's business in the AI, tech space, machine learning, really, you know, more of the hard, hard tech front. Um, places like, for instance, Amsterdam have really pushed the fact that they're a very dynamic ecosystem, right, with a big amalgamation of big companies, but also small enough that there's a good dialogue. Places like Luxembourg that you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the term Luxembourg, is heavily punching above its weight in terms of geographic size. It's tiny, right? Makes it's sense. tiny. Yeah, yeah. But but it's Prison serving capital. basically all of Europe. Yeah, but it's basically yeah. serving all of Europe in terms of financial right. services and such. Um, but they're one of the things they are done really real well is because they're such a small city state per se. Yeah, everybody knows each other. So you can meet the prime minister in the line at the supermarket, which means that <laughs> ideas get across very, very quickly. Everybody knows Trans each other. We know really. the projects yeah. that are being worked on. Um, and so things can be done rapidly and in a very non-confrontational manner. Abu Dhabi and, you know, the UAE as a whole, right, is special in the fact that it has a lot of top down government um, support, which you don't get in a lot of places, actually, right? Mm. The governments here, whether it is in Dubai or it is in Abu Dhabi, is heavily investing in the startup culture. It's heavily investing in upskilling its citizens. It's heavily investing in creating a really nice environment. And as well as government entities, they're also pushing to have that dialogue take place. And so that really makes for a, a nice, comfortable, I guess, startup environment um, where, you, where founders can essentially come here and really give it a good shot and really focus on what's important, which is actually proving that their product works in the market. And um, that actually leads me to, to your next question, which was, okay, so what ADGM is up to and what ADGM you know, is looking to do in the market, right? And I'm super excited by this, actually. Like this is this is the big thing for me. So for the last few years, regulators have had something called regulatory sandboxes, right? So it's basically these sandboxes, which are a basic, you know, space or um, framework where rules don't apply anymore, or they apply, but there's gonna you're gonna not be punished if you break the rules because you're doing it, right. you know, in a transparent manner, right? And it's worked to some extent, right? It's been a really good way for regulators to have a look at new technologies, see whether it fits into their rules, see if they have to make changes, et cetera. Now, companies and banks and things like that, when they work with fintechs and they work with startups, they also have something called a sandbox often, or they've built it themselves. But for them, it's normally, if they do do it, it's a little section of their data center or their IT um, stacks where they have pre-production environments to test whether these startups actually work. They actually say what's written on the tin. Because we all know that startups can claim everything they want in the world, but do they actually work? It has to be proven, right? right? Yeah. And as the regulator here, um, ADGM had this wonderful idea, right? And really phenomenal of building something called a digital lab. So the idea was it would be an essentially a completely digital um, infrastructure that we've had built for us so we wholly own the product, which would allow startups to connect to the digital lab, um, basically display their APIs, display their products, um, have mm -hmm. their API certified, and would also allow financial institutions to connect into the digital lab as well. And we actually provide uh, containers and infrastructure for them to test the solutions digitally in our pre-production environments. Wow, that's super interesting. Um, wow. So, so th there's a kind of um, digital sandbox, and presumably, what you're saying is the entrepreneur or the the, the 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 individuals working on a fintech solution can send their code or their API to the sandbox, and then the other end, the B2B relationship, the bank or the financial institution, can partner with them or experiment with that API or that code to see how viable it is within their own networks. And then presumably they can tweak and edit and discuss as required. And everyone retains their own IP, but it's a great way to kind of test what's possible. Exactly, and they do it in a secure neutral wow. environment that's basically overseen right. by us as the regulator, 
who are That's essentially a not-for-profit. We're not here to you right. know, make money off any wow. of this. We're just here to make the basically the ecosystem grow. And in mm. order to make it all the more um, beneficial to everybody, it's open to everyone. So it's not even just open to UAE startups or UAE financial institutions. We can have startups from across the world, anywhere in the world. Um, so fintechs can come and connect to the digital lab and basically display their products to financial institutions from also across the world, which are looking to see mm. what's there and to then they can connect. So that essentially means that we have, we're building this digital marketplace that's then connected to an actual digital testing ground that where the stuff can actually be looked at and connected and trialed and seen if it's viable. And uh, the reason we did this is because we didn't wanna just help ourselves. We wanted to just help everybody. So one of the good and interesting um, things this means is not only does it mean that the banks feel more safe and secure, um, it accelerates their procurement processes because they're not mm -hmm. doing anything in-house internally at all. They're just testing things outside in a safe environment. But it also means that if you're a financial institution, I don't know, in a different country, and you're not sure if you're maybe you know in a regulatory gray zone, what you can do is also ask or invite your regulator to join our digital sandbox to have a look so they can go and look under the hood and say okay what's happening here and uh, should can we should we allow it in our home jurisdiction so we want this to be a tool for everybody financial institutions fintechs and regulators so that we can have more and more solutions and fintech products that hit the market and actually get to consumers which is what we want that's kind of fascinating i mean there's there's a big kind of discussion on globalization there and how increasingly, uh, you know, emerging technology applications are kind of pushing globalization in reverse. So emerging economies like the UAE are actually coming up with case studies that are filtering out and going back and influencing the older, in some ways, um, more mature, but sometimes less agile markets. But um, on, on a kind of separate discussion, what you've, what you've really brought up is, is a collaboration between um, government and entrepreneurs and regulators to kind of seed some of these new ideas now, you know and I think that's also the way technology and a wider conversation is shifting too. five six years ago in the Middle East and, and in particular but but also um, you know in London and the US the entrepreneur it was always about entrepreneurship the individual entrepreneur the front of the magazine was the entrepreneur most of our discussions around technology were around you know buzzwords or the idea of you know the the kind of almost hero figure you know building something new and now you kind of have this understanding that um, government is also a a focal point for pushing out innovation and that collaboration and support from government doesn't might not just mean you know passing some laws that help SMEs it, it, it actually means a more active role in partnering with ecosystems to create things like you've discussed, such as the digital lab, or to kind of create conditions where entrepreneurs can gain access to the banks. So, I mean, in your experience, is, is government also becoming an increasingly important stakeholder, not just in creating the conditions, but in working alongside technologists and new institutions in birthing some of these new ideas? So I think the government was always important. They were always were. It's just that, like you mentioned, we we didn't want to hear about them. Um, when when it comes down to it, we still really, really like the myth of the founder. You know, that one solo hero that's going out there right. and causing havoc, causing chaos, <laughs> and you know, building a multi-million billion empire. And you know, that, that that's what we like. We don't want to hear yeah. about all the meetings that took place behind closed doors with different government entities and different government agencies. We don't wanna think about the policy experts that sat down and looked at this and then said, okay, what is the risk to people? Is there a risk? What is the benefit? And did it actually sat down and did a cost benefit analysis of changing this legislation? Because it's not sexy, right? It mm -hmm. doesn't make you know the cover of Forbes. It doesn't make you know policy analysts does social cost benefit analysis on the chain, the effects of changing, you know, law three B four in order to allow payments, you know, to go through, for instance, Facebook, you know, that's not the story we want people like to consume, but there's so many people in so many different government entities and agencies and just across, you know, whether it's also investors that are working at night, trying to, you know, get their founders connected to the right people. Right. 
that it takes a village to create these success stories. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing about the Abu Dhabi ecosystem and just the UAE as a whole, because ultimately, you know, we are here ABGM, but we're here to support the UAE, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it, it is that, you know, having this government understanding and having this government dialogue that's consistently there and consistently open allows us to get that information out and actually be able to support these founders the best we can. Because as a regulator, what, what is your role? Is it just to say no? No, it's not just to say no. Your role is to get out good products to people, right? Right. And that means okay, supporting so the right success stories. Yeah, and with that in mind, maybe we should go into kind of some of the less glamorous detail on some of the things that ADGM does every day. So I've got a couple of baskets. So we wanted to ask you a bit about digital banking, a bit about some of what's going on in fintech, and mostly this idea of reg tech and, and you know, financial regulation. But just in terms of digital banking, because I know now we're talking about fintech, and I, I don't know too much of, of the history on this, but, you know, digital banking popped up on all of us almost unawares. It just kind of made sense. And we already had so many apps on our phone but but as you said it kind of does show that there are so many back ends um, and so much kind of data flowing through these banks millions of transactions i'm sure every day or every hour you know i don't know the figures that you know banks have been crossing over to digital for quite some time um so kind of what is ada adgm working on in particular in the digital market i know you know we've got um I've read about it trying to help SMEs. I know there's a digital banking framework and there's also some discussion on SME lending and transactional banking, but just a short summary of kind of why digital banking is important and, and what are the, some of the things that, that are being looked at? So I think ultimately, and actually there's two, two points to my answer. Um, one is going to be about definitely uh, digital banking and, and broader open finance. And the second point will be how we're trying to help the SME ecosystem, which is Thanks, yeah. actually also very exciting. It doesn't sound very right. like, glamorous right now. No, it's no, also it does. Very exciting. It, <laughs> I, I actually find that very interesting because obviously for SMEs, that's critical. So, yeah. yeah. So digital banking is evidently very, very important. And we have, for instance, um, different licensed digital banks within the, the ADGM. But it goes further than that because digital banking is just connecting to your bank and then getting information. Ultimately, you want to get to a point where consumers are going to be able to access at a touch of a button all their different financial type information, whether that's uh, random payment wallets that they have, whether it's retirement accounts, whether it's investments, whether it's their day-to-day -day banks. And we that falls under the idea of, have, of open finance, right? Not just to do with banking, because there are evidently entities that deal with payments and such that aren't necessarily banks, deposited banks that take in, in cash. And so we recently put out an open finance framework to basically allow all these different fintechs that provide these solutions and also other companies um, to connect under the HM framework to be able to provide consumers with all this information so that they can aggregate and also better understand their financial situations. So that's quite inter interesting. And we're, we're quite excited about putting out the open finance framework. Um, mostly because it means that it's going to give better control to consumers, right? If you're able to have access to, to all your financial sources, not just your banks and such, you have a better picture of what's happening around. And that sort of pushes more for financial literacy. So it's great on the literacy mm -hmm. part. It's also great on the financial inclusion part because we're able to connect to, you know, people who may not have uh, all the, have access to all the classical digital banking or banking, traditional banking products. And that's one of the, the basically the main points that we want is to allow a cohesive environment and a holistic approach to all of finance in general. So not just digital banking, but I think digital banking is important just because it's, you know, it's snazzier, it's, you know, easier, it's easier to have access to, and that falls under, you know, digital banking and open finance and also just data protection, right? So that everything falls mm. in such a way as, you know, consumers are protected, consumers are safe and consumers have all the information that they need. Now going right. to the SME, SME landing part, which is, I, I think it's awesome. Um, we're currently in the process of launching an SME platform. And that is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, essentially the idea is that the backbone of a really good economy, you know, an economy that can get past, you know, financial crisis, that can get past 
pandemic crises that can get past all sorts of shocks and waves and such is that they have a good SME sector, right? It can't all just be large corporations, right? It has to have, you know, a plethora of different types of SMEs and such. So that's a mark of a, of a great and fairly, you know, robust economy. Now, one of the issues that we found is that it can be a little bit difficult, and this isn't a problem for the UA, it's a problem as a whole across the world. This is a world problem. Mm. It is hard for SMEs to get lending, right? It, it just yeah. is, because either they're, let's say, startups. I mean, we call them startups, but ultimately they are they fall under the SME category, right? They're startups and they mm. haven't been in business long enough to provide all the information they need to banks in order to get a loan. Um, also, if you are, for instance, a startup, you might not necessarily want to always go to investors to raise money. Maybe you're really, really confident in your product and you actually just need a bridge loan for a few months, right? Because there was slightly less sales because of, let's say, an exogenous shock to the economy. And you don't want to go yeah. and give up 15% equity to investors. But still, right. if you don't have the information, it can be hard to get that loan. And banks on their side understandably, they have less of a risk appetite for small mm. companies. So small companies, SMEs that will probably not have the best return on their investment, like they're not going to jack up the rates anyway. Um, usually it's smaller amounts. It's not the multi-million, uh, multi-million dollars, you know, dirhams, euros yeah. of trade financing they're used to with large corporations. And so all in all, there's a bit of a disconnect. And, you know, you get great SMEs that just don't get access to um, lending. And so we're currently in the process of building out a platform to allow SMEs to basically apply to loans, connect to the, digit, the, the various um, financial institutions in the UAE, apply for loans. And then we're also working to basically integrate different source of government data in order to fill up and help out them out with their applications in order to make it easier for financial institutions to be able to basically de-risk the uh, means of lending out to SMEs. And I think I'm very excited about that because ultimately, if you have, if SMEs have access to lending as opposed to just investments or just, you know, mm. extortionate rates from, you know, money sharks or, you know, borrowing from family and friends, it makes it easier for people to get onto the onto this adventure of launching their own company, um, launching their own startup. And it gives them the stability to actually go on and do business and that all in in a whole helps the economy so we're really looking to do yeah, that no. and that it's a great. uae I mean, initiative yeah. oh that's good so it's uae wide yeah i mean definitely i spoke to a couple of smes who were talking about kind of their experience during COVID 19 and um one of the the big things was you know we're grateful to be here it's so much better than a lot of parts of the world but one of the hardest things is walking into a bank um, because, you know, just getting access to a credit card is hard for us. Getting loans is very difficult e everywhere, as you said. But there was one lady from the banking industry who, who was on the call and she said, it's actually more complicated than you think because a lot of the banks don't actually have the auditing process or the kind of regulatory process to understand who and why they should give loans to. And it's often quite ad hoc. And, and, and that makes it even more risky than it might ordinar ordinarily be with, with, a, with a smaller company. So kind of the discussion was on the one side, yeah, it's tough for the entrepreneurs, but also if, if you're in a bank and you have to kind of make that call, the, the decision-making structure is actually still, still quite, it, it's not actually set in place. So that was kind of really interesting for everyone. And I, I guess, you know, that, that kind of service, if it's UAE wide, particularly you know, given the experience of the past 12 to 14 months, you know, I can see why that would be really useful. Um, on that note then, because there's also this new phrase that I only heard, I think, la late last year, which is reg tech, uh, <laughs> regulation technology. And I mean, it was fascinating because we were talking about it in the, in the kind of context of, of, of AI and algorithms and the, I, the idea that, that, that actually elements of regulation uh, because you know, again, you have the the idea of the, the the bureaucratic person at the desk filing in paperwork. But one of the things um, I was told is that the volume of transactions is now so much that it's impossible for any human being or any series of human beings to really interdict meaningfully. Therefore, you kind of need regulations that are written in code or that uh, or that are able to kind of uh, observe some of these millions of transactions and spot patterns. 
And so, I mean, that was kind of the discussion I've had on RegTech in the past. Um, what what is RegTech? How is it working? You know, what is the size of the industry? Are people moving into it? What's this all about? So I've got I've got a new word for you. If you want to just add one in there to <laughs> complete your vocabulary, we also have SupTech now. So supervisory I had, tech. I heard that one too. <laughs> right. So that what I discussed might be more subtech then, right? Because I guess it's scanning and, and pattern matching. So what's the difference between reg tech and subtech? I'm not even going to answer that because then we get caught up into semantics and I don't want purists <laughs> coming out after me. <laughs> My DMs will be filled with hate. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's clearly controversial. Okay, I didn't know the financial uh, technology sector was so, yeah. <laughs> Good, so full of well, trolls, but anyway. <laughs> oh, there is, it's like, you know, you have, st okay, startup, upstart, versus, no, startup versus upstart versus scale up, fintech versus tech fin. <laughs> there's a okay. lot of, there's a lot of, you know, semantics wow. out there, but yeah, let's, that's, that, that's on anyway. the side. <laughs> yeah. That could be a whole topic for a whole conversation. What's the vocab right. in tech these days? Abbreviations at the end of the uh, interview, but yeah. Exactly. No, but the thing about rec tech, um, which is, is, is fundamental is the fact that, you know, let, let me take it back. People shouldn't be made to just look at if a machine can do it better. Why do we have people do it? You know, the whole point about people in general is to train them up to have value add skills that they can, you know, interact mm -hmm. with a new information and they can think about it and then they can, you know, really do what they're trained to do. That's the case with all regulators, people who are compliance officers, people who are overseeing, you know, different aspects of the compliance process and the supervisory process. Um, so evidently, ideally, we would love to go down the route where, you know, we have regulatory technology that essentially, you know, really matches up with the rules. In an ideal world, all our rule books would be, you know, codified and would feed in straight into you know, regular, regulatory technology. And when updated that, those new updates would automatically feed into all the programs and such. And it would allow compliance officers and regulators to do what they do best, which is you know, really adapt to different changes in market and different changes in technology, which is ultimately what human beings are there to do, right? Not just do a look at numbers day in, day out, if we have wonderful technology that can do it. So evidently there's a really, really big push because Regular technology, regulatory technology can help aid compliance officers and help aid people, but can also help aid us as regulators. Because if we know that there's, you know, really great technology that's being used in this and this situation, then it gives us confidence and we're able to build up our rule books appropriately. And it also allows us mm. to oversee, you know, better and more efficiently, right? So it, it's, it's an exciting space, um, lots of trials being done, lots of pilots being done. Eventually one of the, the key components is that a lot of, um, let's say maybe smaller firms it are currently working on upgrading their own systems in order to implement regulatory technology in, because it comes with all, all, all these changes, right? You're not gonna expect everyone to do a switch like that. And then the next day, their entire compliance staff is trained up to use reg tech technology, so well, reg tech technology, you know, regulatory technology, and use these new softwares and able to interpret it op appropriately. But the shift is very much happening. And we're really excited about how this is slowly phasing into different firms and different large corporations, mm. as they start implementing these solutions in, and what that means for us as a role, as a, in our role as a regulator, how we can also implement, you know, these solutions to our own processes to make life easier. So it's currently a change that's happening. We're not there yet. Um, not everything isn't machine readable as of yet. And, you know, we have nothing to do. That's not going to happen. <laughs> not anytime soon. Um, but it, it's very exciting developments that are happening. Right. And I guess just, just finally, what about the discussion between institutions like ADGM and the entrepreneurship and the VC kind of circuit? Because there is kind of you know, there is an element of literacy and understanding some of these concepts. And I know that um, you guys have been working on, on something called special purpose vehicles, which many entrepreneurs might not have been too aware of until, of course, Angami listed on the NASDAQ. And then everyone in Dubai is suddenly, you know, Googling special purpose vehicles, because apparently that played a role in kind of assisting some of what they achieved. Um, and, and there hasn't always been 
a good understanding. You know, a lot of the the focus on entrepreneurs has been how to raise capital, how to you know pitch to investors, how to understand you know equity. But what do you think in terms of education, in terms of understanding how reg tech, fintech, things like special purpose vehicles can actually assist the growth of a company or even the growth of certain uh, industries or ecosystems? Do you think that's something that's going to start becoming more normal? Or do you think everyone's going to remain in their silos and, and the financial world, as we kind of discussed back pre-2008, will, will remain somewhat in its silo? And, and the entrepreneurs will also remain, you know, in their silo with their language? Or do you think the two will, uh, are increasingly going to merge? Um, very honestly, and I say this as, an, as a former investor, is if we have great founders, great entrepreneurs, the last thing on earth I'd want them to do is worry about financial regulation. I mean, they definitely should a bit, but first of all, they should really work on building a product that consumers love. First and foremost, they need product market fit. They need to have something that consumers will use, consumers will need, and that should be their priority day in, day out. And then once they have something that's amazing, that actually functions, that is a value add, that actually gives to society and is useful, that's when the regulators will come in. Because we're like I said, the whole goal with financial regulation stuff is there to protect, but also enhance people's lives. So if there's something that's you know a no-brainer that makes sense that makes life easier for people, we will listen. Regulators across the world will listen, right? Okay, so how ha- about to it after? You, that makes total sense. But just finally, finally, because I have to ask you based on that, um, what about the crypto entrepreneurs and the blockchain guys? <laughs> <laughs> you know, how do they fit into all this then? You know, because I know regulations are improving for them, uh, particularly in Abu Dhabi. Um, Yeah, particularly we have an excellent, excellent, and I say this because I read it (laughs) back in the days before I was at AGM, an absolutely excellent crypto asset framework. Um, We're currently working with a few companies which are going to come be licensed within ADGM. So we're very much, but I can't really talk about it too much. um, We're very much excited to welcome, um, you know, crypto asset entrepreneurs to come into and be licensed by ADGM because fundamentally, I mean, didn't we just see that Coinbase listed yesterday or a couple of days ago? I saw that. Yeah, it was massive. And there's much more yeah. institutional investors that are now in the space. There's a lot more crypto asset, you know, custody solutions. It's kind of, you know, going mainstream. So well, for anyone out there that's going to listen to us that has a crypto asset um, company and is interested, we have a crypto asset framework and we've had one for a few years now. I know a couple of people are looking at Abu Dhabi, actually, not just here in the UAE. But um, Gabriela Indarello, thank you so much for your time today. I've never had so much fun talking about financial technologies. And I think my graduate self would have found this quite a surprising conversation, but things have changed a lot. And I think what ADGM is doing is, is you know, kind of at the forefront of, of the economy, hopefully here, but also overseas as well. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me.